The tendency of the lung is to collapse through its own elastic recoil. But there are two components to that elastic recoil. The two components are the elastic recoil provided by the connective tissue of the lungs, the collagen and other connective tissues within it. But there's also elastic recoil or effective elastic recoil produced by the surface tension from the liquid which lines the inside of the lung. Surface tension is what you get at an air-liquid interface and it's because the water molecules or the liquid molecules at the interface tend to want to attach to each other and bleach each other closer and in doing so that would tend to make the lining of the lung smaller and it would tend to cause the lung to collapse. We can see the important effect of surface tension in an experiment, the results of which are illustrated in this graph. So the graph plots transmural pressure against volume. Transmural pressure, transmural means across the wall, and this is the difference in pressure between what's inside your lung and what's outside. And that transmural pressure is going to be what's causing the lung to inflate or causing it to collapse. If you look at the inflation and deflation of an isolated lung that's just been removed from somebody's body, it's still got air in it, you get the lower picture here. Now the inflation curve and the deflation curve don't coincide. That's referred to as hysteresis. Hysteresis is a general scientific term which refers to the non-coincidence of associated phenomena. And in this case, inflation and deflation, you would imagine, would be associated. But for some reason, the curves actually differ. Now, it turns out that that hysteresis is due to the effect of surfactant, which we'll look at in more detail in just a little while. What's interesting here is to look at the overall gradient of that particular curve at any point, I suppose. The gradient is going to be the difference in volume divided by the difference in pressure y over x. And the difference in volume divided by the difference in pressure is what we refer to as compliance. So if there's a steeper curve, your lung is more compliant than if the curve is more shallow. Now what's particularly interesting here is to compare this result to the result with the dotted line, which is when you have a lung filled with saline. And this experiment was done by someone called von Niergaard. Now, if you fill up the lung with saline, you might imagine that if it's filled with salty fluid and there's no air in it, it would actually be more difficult for the lung to expand or deflate. But that's not actually the case, because if you look at the saline-filled lung, you can see that the average gradient of the curve from the smallest lung volume to the largest is quite steep. And that means that the compliance is very high. That means it's actually relatively easy to inflate and deflate, you need a smaller pressure in order to inflate it up to its maximum volume. And the reason, of course, is that if you fill a lung with saline, you eliminate the air-liquid interfaces that are responsible for the surface tension. So what you're doing is removing surface tension completely and leaving only the elastic recoil of the connective tissues of the lung. And that reduces the overall elastic recoil of the lung. That makes it more compliant. That makes it easier to expand. So this experiment neatly demonstrates how important the air-liquid interface is. It contributes quite a lot of the elasticity of the lung and tends to make the lung collapse. Now, the other difference between the saline curve and the air-filled lung curve is the hysteresis, which you only find in the air-filled lung curve. And that's the result of surfactant. Now, surfactant is a special group of molecules which is secreted onto the internal lining of the lung by type 2 epithelial cells, type 2 pneumocytes. And the purpose of the surfactant is to reduce the surface tension between the air and the liquid. Now it doesn't reduce it to zero, but it does still reduce it. And that makes it easier to inflate the lung than if the surfactant wasn't there. It also introduces this phenomenon of hysteresis for reasons that I won't go into now. But the upshot is that if you have to have an air-liquid interface, and we can't avoid that, it will make it more difficult for the lung to inflate, and surfactant helps to counteract that. It makes it easier for the lung to inflate than it otherwise would. And of course, this is brought into sharp focus if you look at infant respiratory distress syndrome, 
in which surfactant is not being produced because the baby has been born too young. In the absence of surfactant, it's very difficult to inflate the lung. The elastic recoil is simply too great, and the baby will suffer greatly unless medical intervention is introduced. The hysteresis that we see is the result of surfactant, and it may have some importance here, because if you look at inspiration as the lung is getting bigger and bigger, if you look at the point towards full inspiration, you can see that the compliance is actually quite low. That you can see because the gradient becomes more shallow. Low compliance means stiffer. And what this means is that as the lung gets really quite big, it becomes stiffer and it becomes difficult to inflate it further. And that might help to prevent overinflation. Then as you look at the descending portion of the curve, you can see that as the lung is declining to a very small size, the slope on the left-hand side of that graph is quite steep. And that means the lung is really quite compliant. And that means that there's less recoil and that helps to prevent it from collapsing completely. So we can see within the hysteresis curve elements that prevent the lung from overinflating and prevent the lung from collapsing as well. So perhaps the hysteresis is important from that point of view.